Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Said Hossein Nasr. Uh, I am a university professor of Islamic studies at the George Washington University. I'm originally Persian, born in Tehran, Iran, and educated both in Iran and uh, in the United States at MIT and Harvard. Former professor and vice chancellor of Tehran University and president of Iran's RMA University. And I migrated to the United States in 1979 and have been teaching there ever since. Thank you very much. Yes, I've written over uh, 50 books and Marshall. over 500 articles in English and French and uh, a couple of hundred in Persian and Arabic. So I have a large output because there's so much demand upon my time. And I try to do the best I can. Whatever we do, we say the law is the best we can do in life. That's why we are here in this world. And inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will enable me to continue to serve him. God is absolute freedom and absolute determination in the sense that God is absolute. When we say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ That Ahad, Ahadiyya, implies the absoluteness, oneness of God. And God is that, so it's absolute determination. But at the same time, he is Qadr ala ma yasha. He is all powerful over what he wills, so has absolute freedom. Now, we as God's creatures, we who in Islam, following the Quran, believe that we are God's vicegerents on earth, Khalifatullah fil ard, have been given by God both of these qualities. We've been given remarkably the gift of freedom, which from the Islamic point of view, going back to the Quran, is related to the amana, to the trust that uh, God asked the mountains and the sky to carry. They refused, but man accepted it. That is the trust of being God's uh, interlocutor, of being his representative on earth, of having the consciousness to follow his religion. Uh, in the Quran, God asks, am I not your Lord? God asks us, which means gives us the freedom to say no. But we said yes. And the verb also is in the plural in, in the Quran, which all of, means all of us. Yes. So we started with the choice that God has given us freedom. And one of the most remarkable aspects of human existence is that uh, we are free even to negate the truth. In the sense, the greatest proof of the existence of God is those who negate him. If I were to understand this philosophically, that is, by negating God, we assert our freedom. Yes. But where does that freedom come from? It can only come from a divine reality that is absolutely free. Because in this world, we don't see freedom. Everything is according to laws of nature. Yeah. And we say, oh, in quantum mechanics, it's the it's statistical laws and so forth. But that's on the uh, macro level. On the physical macro level, uh, this rock is not free not to roll down the hill. This leaf behind me is not free not to be green. It can't decide what money I want to be red. That's what we call laws of nature, natural determinism. But we have this freedom. Now, this freedom is extremely precious, God's greatest gift to us in a certain sense, but also extremely dangerous if one misuses it. That's why in the Islamic point of view, uh, we always start with the responsibility. We are responsible to God. From those responsibilities issue rights. This is what distinguishes the Islamic point of view completely from modernism. Where people keep talking all the time about human rights. If right in the streets of Washington, you go and start carrying a placard attacking God or Christ, nobody will care. But if you start attacking a religious minority or a racial minority, you'll get beaten up in five minutes. Yes. Or you, somebody will take you to court for libel. We live in a world in which the divine is no longer important. Islam does not accept that. That's why there are these reactions. 
when the sacred aspects of Islam are attacked, whether it be the life of the Prophet or the Quran or all of these things that you've seen going on the last few years by certain Westerners. Uh, that's why there is this response, because the sacred is still alive. For us, freedom, therefore, is always combined with responsibility. Rights are always combined with responsibility. There's no such thing as absolute freedom except in God. Only God is absolutely free. Even in the West, where uh, those who negate God, you're not absolutely free to uh, go in a, let's say, a theater, which is dark, and everybody's sitting down. And say, so, oh, there's a big bomb here, or there's a fire here. Everybody gets up, start running out, some people get killed. You're responsible to be put in prison. There's no absolute freedom of speech. And one of the worst things that is happening is that in the West today, that this is accepted. If you deny the Holocaust in France, uh, England, the cradle of modern uh, freedom, three years imprisonment. There's not just absolute free speech. But if you curse Islam, that's probably all right. That's free, free speech. And we're living in really hypocrisy, worst kind of hypocrisy at the present moment. And it's the duty of Muslims at least to realize the world in which we're living and try to be wise in dealing with these problems. And shouting alone is not going to solve it. In any case, to come back to the fundamentals, it's impossible to have religion without both freedom and constraint, without responsibility and rights, which issue from those responsibilities. Uh, we uh, are free to the extent that we attach ourselves to God. It's very interesting. Let's take the Muslim prayers. The Surah Al-Fatiha, which we recite 17 times a day. We say, Thee do we worship, and in Thee do we take refuge. We are addressing God. What are we doing? We're giving up our freedom, in a certain sense. By taking refuge in God. You take your refuge in the house of a king. You've given up your freedom. You can't play football inside the house. You can't have to sit in some corner because you're in a royal palace. This is, you're taking refuge in God. So this is, seems that from one point of view, you're giving, giving up our freedom. And many atheists today always argue like, like that. This new wave of atheism that's coming out of England, uh, these people who keep writing against God and religion, that we give, that those people who religion give up the freedom. But no. That giving up freedom is what really makes us free, because it frees us from our own egos. So the question of freedom and religious duty are not so superficial. By performing religious duties, what God expects of us, we gain more freedom, freedom from our ego, from our nafs, which you also have in Turkish, nafs. Uh, the, the, Alamara, the, the lower nafs, lower nafs. Yeah. And it is that which gives us freedom. Otherwise, we think we are free if we can do anything we want. But that means we are uh, imprisoned by our own ego. The more one is immersed in one's passion, the less free he is or she is. And this is a lesson that we have to learn. Our tradition in Islam, especially the Sufi tradition, is extremely rich in showing us that the only real freedom is freedom from limitation. And the first step in freedom from limitation is from our own limitations. How do I get out of the prison of my own ego? How do I transcend all the negative tendencies within me of hatred, of jealousy, of deceit, all of these things that are in us? that make us get up every morning, various passions, <clears throat> greed, uh, and that's what really governs us. And religion is there to save us from ourselves, because within us there is an immortal soul which yearns for the freedom it had before it fell into this world. Anyway, this is an extremely important issue, and for Muslims, while they should definitely try to give more space to discussion, to freedom of thought. At the same time, they should realize 
what the deep meaning of freedom is. And a freedom cannot destroy those very instruments which free us from our ego and then claim to be freedom. On the intellectual level, I'm always in favor of having an open space for discussion. In the 1400 years of Islamic civilization, the periods in which the Islamic intellectual life had been most brilliant, like the 11th century, 13th century, times like that, uh, a bit later in Spain, uh, before, uh, well, it's been 12th and 13th century, uh, has been times when the atmosphere, the space was open, and you had uh, the Asharites against the philosophers that are debating with each other, and the Sufis against various schools of Kalam, various schools of theology. Remar remarkable how diverse opinions were. Look at the thousands of commentaries written even from the Quran itself, where different great Mufassirun, uh, great uh, uh, commentators, Persian, Arab, Turkish, whatever, Indian, pa Muslim, Pakistani, what is, uh, give different me understandings of even a particular verse of the Quran. And then all of the other issues. We need in the Islamic world an open intellectual atmosphere. I'm a philosopher, besides being a the what the West would call theologian, I'm an Islamic thinker. And uh, I think that we should give the right in our universities for people to discuss what they want, even if they're against Islam, even if they're against religion. I would not kick them out. When I was dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science of Tehran University, which is a center of Persian culture, was for many years the dean. I would bring uh, Jewish professors, uh, even two communist professors who were originally Muslim, but had gone to France and become leftists. It's not you having uh, a plane of them in Turkey. That kind of people who were against all that. Uh, so not the Jewish one, this communist one, they're atheists. But they were good historians. I said, let them come. Let the people hear what they have to say. And if we are, have the truth, we'll always win out. And if we don't, we will correct our ways. So I'm, I'm one of the people who is very much against censoring thinking. But that's different from destroying the web of life of people, destroying other people's iman, faith. And I believe that the Islamic world today is a lot more of an open space intellectually, what you call freedom of thought. But also consider this from the Islamic point of view. Not just be a slave or imitator of what has been known as free thinking, libre penseur in French, which goes back to the 18th century enlightenment. That's another way of looking at the world. That's another way of looking at the world. We were not any less free than Voltaire was in France in the 18th century, who hated Catholicism and Christianity. Uh, we had a lot of thinkers who did, said all kinds of things. But Islam was strong enough. So it's Voltaire, they're not against it. That's something else. That's something else. Other, other, intellectually, the debates of an Ibn Kamuna, uh, against Ibn Sina, things like that, are just intellectually trenchant as any French philosopher against St. Thomas Aquinas. So people get these confused, and that is a subject for another day. I don't want to get into it. The Quranic instruction of protecting the Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, and in the place of worship, were followed. Jews and Christians in the Ottoman Empire had their own churches and synagogues. They even had high positions in the government, some of them. Yeah. They're Jewish ministers in the Ottoman period. Even and generals, Armenian and generals. And same in, in Persia and most Islam. Occasionally there was some ruler who would do something. That's a minority. Look at Egypt, the center of the Arab world, where 9% of the people remained Christian to this day, the Coptics people. And with all these centuries, they could have cut all their head off if they wanted to. There was not a question of having political power or economic power. It was Islamic law that protected them. Yes. So I'm glad you mentioned that because some Muslims haven't been pressured so much by Western colonial powers in the 19th century are now reacting in a way which is not really authentically Islamic. First of all, they call all non-Muslims kafirs. 
Now, this is, it's true that when the Ottoman army was fighting against the uh, Viennese or Austrian Empire in the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, they called us uh, pagans or something like that, and the Muslims called them kafirs. But that was just everyday language. That was not theological. It was not the theologically. The Ahlul Kitab are not kafirs. No, That's why the yeah. Quran tells us to protect them. Yes. The Quran will never tell us protect this man who so will go to hell after when he dies. Obviously, the fact that he wants us to protect these people means that they have a right to life, and there's no coercion in converting them. As you said, la ikra din. There is no compulsion in religion. Yes. That's a very famous verse of the Quran. So you're absolutely right that this is an important issue to bring up. As for what is common between the Abrahamic family of religions, let me give you this example. Supposing you have two a sister and a brother. Three of you are sitting in a room and having coffee in Istanbul. Of course, you know your sister and brother very well, and uh, you have a lot, might have a lot of fights with each other, what they call a sibling fighting, even when you're a little child over a doll or over a cake, or when you grow up over this, over that. that but there are your sisters and brothers. But somebody comes from the outside and says, oh my God, you people all look so much like each other. But you yourself don't realize that. Now, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are like these sisters and brothers. They belong to the same family of religions. If you bring a Buddhist or a Hindu to look at these three, three religions, he or she will be astounded by the similarities in comparison with all other great religions of the world. It's like Confucianism, Taoism, the many other great religions who have guided hundreds of millions of people over the ages, Hinduism, because honestly, they don't exist. But they're not in the family of Abrahamic religions. Yes. I'm a person who spent all of his life to show that in all religions of the world, all authentic Samawi heavenly religions, including Hinduism and Buddhism and Shintoism and Taoism and Confucianism, there are very profound similarities of unity. And the Quran says we have sent to every people a messenger. Surely God will not send a messenger with a lie to China and one with truth to Palestine. The God is just and merciful. Why should he be merciful to me in Palestine and not merciful to you in Beijing and send you a false message? That's not possible. So the fact that God has sent the message to every people means the truth has been sent to every people. And there is an inner truth which are great thinkers, especially since you're a Turk, a person who weds our two countries. I mean, Iran and you're a Turk. That is Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi writes about so eloquently 700 years ago. I could quote poems of his uh, for the next half hour. I don't have time right now. But those who know Mevlana know how much he uh, spoke about the inner unity of religions, the transcendent unity of religions. And he had, in fact, uh, Christian and Jewish disciples. When he died in Gonya, there are separate funeral services held in churches and synagogues for him. Not only in mosques, and not only was he buried where he is buried, the maqam. Uh, so uh, we have a long history of the realization of that. And one of the great tragedies happening in the Islamic world right now is at the very time when we need this universalist perspective, many people are becoming much more exclusive. In almost every Islamic country, a grandfather is more open to the understanding of, of similarity with other religions than the grandson who just become a Salafi or Wahhabi or something like that, newborn Muslim, and because, because he wants to protect himself because of the attack of modernism. He's become very rigid, very hard. I've seen this a hundred times in almost every Islamic country. It's a very unfortunate phenomenon, but we have to stand against it. Turkey is one of the places which, because of the attack of modernism against Islam for so many decades is a very good space uh, to be able to preserve this aspect of Islam that is of amity with other religions, 
going back to the remarkable achievement of the Ottomans in this domain. Remarkable achievement. Uh, so many stories to tell you. I know you're a Turk, but maybe you don't know all of, all of this history. Uh, that even in uh, Syria, which was not Turkish, it was Arab, but a part of the Ottoman Empire, in the 19th century, there was a riot in which the Muslims went and burned a few stores of Christians and killed, I think, nine, ten Christians. The Ottoman caliph sent the prime minister, Saad Azam, the, uh, to Damascus. I think it was Ibrahim Pasha, one of the great Pashas. Yeah. Anyway, and he sat down in the street where the event had taken place and had all the different witnesses come who had done what. And after determining who were the people who killed the Christians, the Qadi came and they were all condemned to death and hanged right there. From the 19th century on, there has not been a single conflict between Christians and Muslims in Damascus. Until now, when with uh, these yes. extremist money coming out of uh, from outside, they're fanning the fire of the, all these Salafi Wahhabi extremists within Syria and attacking churches. So uh, this is a very, very important issue. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism have, first of all, the most important thing in common: they believe in the one God. The Christians do not believe in three gods. That's misunderstanding. It's a popular misunderstanding. The Catholic uh, Aqida, that is the credo, the creed, which the Catholics recite, they've recited for 2,000 years in Latin, is credo in unum deum in Latin. I believe in the one God. So that's the most important thing. God is the center of all reality. They believe in the immortality of the soul. They believe in our responsibility before God. They believe in good and evil and its effect upon the soul. They believe in, in the moral life. And most of their moral teachings are very similar. For example, all three accept the Ten Commandments God revealed to Sayyidina Musa, salam, to Moses. Murder, adultery, theft, yeah. lying, and so forth. We, uh, so was, we share together. Yeah. Yes, there are certain things we do not share together. For example, the Christians have a different kind of sexual ethics. For example, the monasticism, we do not. We have multiple marriage in certain instances, they do not. They consider uh, uh, sexuality to be a sin. Islam does not consider it to be a sin. Consider it to be a holy gift by God, that, but has to be regulated by the Sharia. So the Christian marriage is a sacrament. The Islamic marriage is an aqd. It's a very different, it's, an, it's a legal agreement between a man and a woman. There are differences, I'm not saying they're identical. We love the same prophets. Um, yes, uh, for example, they, uh, Christians, uh, they differ more from the Jews and Muslims on this issue than the Jews and Muslims do with each other. They consider the, their founder to be a divine being. Jews and Muslims believe, believe that only God is a divine being. So we reject the incarnation and the Trinity, and so do the Jews. But those are theological issues. The similarities are much, much greater than the differences. And I pray and hope that all people of good faith in all of these religions, but I address especially my own core religions, Muslims, Sunni and Shiite, Sufi and Salafi, theological and philosophical, to try to open their hearts about the question of other religions. And let God decide. Let God decide on the day of judgment. We should follow our duties as promulgated in the Quran. The blood of Christians and Jews and other Ahl al-Kitab, because the Quran doesn't limit the Ahl al-Kitab to, to Jews and Christians. The Sabi'un were considered to Ahl al-Kitab, later on Zoroastrians were considered to Ahl al-Kitab, when Islam went to uh, Iran, and they still are. Uh, they are a member in parliament. They're not considered to be heathens or something like that. Uh, so anyway, those people who believe in the one God, you know, divine reality, even if they don't use the word God, our hearts should be open to them. The first Chinese to become Muslim 
preceded the first Turk becoming yeah. a Muslim by several centuries. Except all the Turks embraced Islam, not all the Chinese did. But the oldest mosque in Nanking was, was before any Turk became a Muslim. So those people, for centuries, lived amidst the Confucian and Taoists. And if you talk to them, they believe that Confucius was a prophet. So